Edo Arctic 2, Polar Research for Education, innovative program in Poland and Norway. Webinars. Dr. E, I will give this presentation uh, now. Svalbard, uh, many people think that Svalbard is located at the North Pole, but it's not true. If you see uh, the Northern Hemisphere in the middle, there is the North Pole here. And some 1,200 kilometers south from the North Pole, there is Svalbard, the archipelago. Uh, this archipelago uh, includes all islands between latitude 74 and 81 degrees north and between longitude 10 to 35 degrees east. The biggest island of this archipelago is Spitsbergen. And sometimes people confuse those two names, Svalbard, but Svalbard is archipelago, and Spitsbergen, the island. Uh, some people think that uh, Spitsbergen is archipelago, but, but it's not true. That's the biggest island of this archipelago. Uh, if you would see the Svalbard from above, you would be surprised how highly glaciated it is. There's many huge glaciers that terminate in the sea. There's plenty of glaciers that terminate on land. And there's just uh, some uh, bare areas without ice uh, where you can find mountains, valleys, and glacially eroded fjord systems. The highest mountain of Svalbard is Newton Toppen and it's 1,717 meters above sea level. Uh, what about the climate? The climate is highly influenced by ocean currents. Uh, to the west, there is West Spitsbergen current, which is a branch of the Gulf Stream that brings relatively warm water and changes the climate there. It's much warmer than, than at the same latitude in Greenland, for example. Uh, east of Spitsbergen, uh, there is East Spitsbergen current that brings colder water masses with a lot of drift ice from the Arctic Ocean in the North Pole Basin, making the eastern, uh, eastern part of the archipelago colder, which uh, with much heavier ice conditions. So it's not that easy to reach the, uh, the east part of Svalbard. Usually when people go around Svalbard by yachts, in some years it's not possible, but recently there's less and less sea ice, so it, it, be, it is possible, but only in recent decades. Mean annual temperature uh, for Spitsbergen is around minus six degrees. And I'm saying Spitsbergen because that's the biggest island and there's multiple different islands with different meteorological stations. Uh, so for example, to the south where the Bjorn Oya, Bjorn Island is located, it would be much warmer. But for Spitsbergen, it's around minus six degrees throughout the, uh, the average uh, temperature. Uh, the warmest month is July with temperatures oscillating around plus five degrees. During winter and spring, Temperatures are around minus 15, minus 12 degrees. And there is low annual sum of precipitation, but it varies. To the west, where the West Spitsbergen uh, current is uh, influencing, there is higher precipitation, around 500 millimeters. In uh, central and south uh, and uh, northeastern part, the precipitation is much lower and it's around 200 millimeters. So it's really low. Uh, I'll be showing you different pictures that I took throughout my expeditions to, uh, to Spitsbergen. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've been tra traveling there almost every uh, year. And on the pictures, you will see usually great conditions because this is when you are able to take beautiful photos. But usually the weather conditions are pretty harsh. There is uh, strong wind, low temperatures, and actually it's not that ple uh, pleasant as it may see from further pictures that I will show you. Just have in mind it's high Arctic, it's far north, so the weather conditions are pretty harsh. Uh, there is a question, what's the best time to visit? Depending on what you expect uh, to see. If you love to see northern lights, the best time to go is during polar night that lasts from the end of October 
till the beginning of uh, February. So during you know this time it's uh, dark, but there is northern lights uh, lights on the sky. If you want to uh, drive snowmobile, the best conditions would would be during uh, spring time. Uh, and during springtime, uh, there is lots of snow. All the tundra is covered by snow, so you can travel around on skis or on snowmobile. Uh, if you prefer to walk around to see green uh, blooming flowers uh, and uh, wildlife, for example, millions of birds that come only for the summer, it's better to go during the summer. Each season is different. Uh, each, se each season is characterized by uh, different temperatures, uh, different wildlife that comes, and yeah, the views are different. Each day in Svalbard is actually different. So it depends on what you expect and you want to see. Uh, the name Svalbard uh, comes from old legends, uh, Svalbardi Fundin, that means frozen shores. And probably Svalbard was found by the Vikings, but there is no hard evidence for that. But later in the 15th century, uh, there were pomors, hunters and fishermen from uh, the White Sea coast of Russia. Knew, uh, they knew uh, Spitsbergen as a good hunting ground before it was officially discovered because the official discovery of Svalbard was made by an uh, expedition led by Dutchman Willem Barents in 1596. And this expedition, uh, at the end of the 16th century, uh, gave the information to whole Europe about the environment, about the abundance of wildlife there. And this is how the whalers appeared in Svalbard. After this journey, whaling started in Spitsbergen uh, in near shore waters. There were thousands and millions actually of different species and whales were hunted by the, those whalers. They were flanced. Blubber was brought to the whaling station and boiled in large copper pots. First, those uh, copper pots were on land, but soon it became uh, the, the fjords became empty. There were no uh, whales because they were hunted. They didn't come back. So ships had to go further and further to the sea. Uh, so then they put the copper pots on the ships. And why they were hunting whales? Because they needed oil and the oil was uh, used for, for example, lamps. Uh, all these years of intensive hunting had almost led to the extinction of um, whales in Svalbard. Uh, even now you can see remnants of this era uh, on shores of, for example, Hornsund Fjord. There is, for example, lots of schools from the whaling station, as you can see on the picture to the right but the whaling stopped. It was, uh, the species became end endangered, so they become protected. And recently we observed that more and more whales are coming back to Svalbard. So uh, for example, people take pictures now as they're tourists. They observe humpback whales as on this picture, blue whales, orcas, dolphins, bowhead whales, and lots of other whales that are uh, that appeared, especially during summer. Some of them stay throughout the year. But after those whalers left, because there were no whales in the surroundings of Svalbard, hunters came. And their primary target was to catch as many polar foxes and bears as possible to sell their fur. They, they were selling this fur in Norway and also in different countries, but those hunters came from Norway. And they also collected down from either ducks. Down was used for, uh, you know, like pillows or recently down is used uh, as a filling in your warm uh, down jackets. Reindeers and seals and ptarmigans were mostly taken for local use because their, you know, meat was not as, not, not so good for selling, but to live in Svalbard, they were hunted because they were needed. The, the meat was eaten by those hunters. And the reason for overwintering of all these hunters, because they stay over winter, was that only the winter fur brought good profit. Because the summer fur is comparatively 
worthless. So as you can see, for example, in the case of polar fox, Arctic fox during summer in the upper picture and Arctic fox during winter. So as you can imagine, those uh, foxes were hunted during winter because of, of their fear. Now it's actually not happening and uh, foxes are protected. Polar bears are protected by law since 1973 in Svalbard and this year finished all the hunting on bears. Uh, before, during a year, there were hundreds of bears killed by hunters. And the scientific expeditions uh, that came to Svalbard in the, the end of the 19th century uh, started new era for Svalbard. And it's ongoing. There's plenty of scientists coming every year and living there in Svalbard just for pure scientific reasons. For example, in 1882, 1883, there was International Polar, Polar Year and the station was established by Sweden in Kap Thordsen, as you can see on the picture to the left. Uh, the expedition from 1899 to 1904 was led by Swedes and Russians. The expedition was called the Ark of Meridian Expedition, and it was to define the shape of the Earth by uh, means of very precise astronomical determination of latitude and longitude, as well as topographic work. You can look for more details in the internet about the Ark of Meridian Expedition. It was very successful and there's plenty of information on the internet, more than I can give now during this presentation. Uh, Svalbard was also a great place to start the attempt to reach the North Pole, and there were many attempts. One of them was very tragic in 1897, led by Andre. They tried to uh, reach the North Pole by balloon, uh, and they actually for many years they disappeared after more than 30 years they were found all dead in Kvit Oya, one of the islands uh, of Svalbard. No one knew for the 30 years where they were gone. Uh, but there was Norge, the airship that carried out the first verified trip to the North Pole and likely the first verified overflight on the 12th of May 1926. It started in Nyalesund and it reached uh, North Pole on that day. Uh, yeah, here is a map of protected areas. I mentioned that many species became protected, but also the environment is protected. Uh, the greenish color shows the national park. The purple one, nature, nature reserves. There's also geotope protection areas. Uh, and you can see most of Svalbard is covered uh, and protected. The mining in the 20th century uh, began because of the industrial revolution that rolled over Europe. Uh, and countries that were fastly developing, they demanded large amounts of raw materials, especially coal. Uh, so the prices for coal became very high and Svalbard was uh, like a magnet to adventurous people looking for huge profit because there is coal in Svalbard. Uh, as in the beginning of the 20th century, Svalbard was a no man's land, so no country uh, was, uh, there were many countries there that were fighting for the areas. And actually there were some occupations by different countries on different parts of Svalbard. And it was quite chaotic until 1920, when the Svalbard Treaty was signed. It was signed in Paris and it put uh, Svalbard and uh, Spitsbergen under uh, Norwegian administration and sovereignty. But guaranteed free access for all citizens that signed the treaty. And this area is also delimitarized. That means there is no uh, troops uh, there, military troops. Uh, several addition, uh, additional nations acceded the treaty after it was ratified in 1920. For example, Poland signed this treaty in 1932. Uh, and recently there's uh, around 46 uh, countries that uh, signed the treaty. And all of them have the same rights uh, that are uh, governed by Norway. So they have freedom of scientific, exploratory and tourist activities.
and Svalbard is visa free. So you can go to Svalbard, you can visit, for example, its capital city, Longyear Bien. Uh, uh, there is also Russian town, Barentsburg. Uh, international uh, scientific station in uh, Neolesund. There is plenty of different nations. They, ha they have own stations in uh, Neolesund. And there is Polish Polar Station in Hornsund. And those are permanently uh, inhabited places. So there's people for whole year. Uh, and it's been like that for many years. This is how long your BN looks like. There is airport, uh, easily reachable every day. There is flights from uh, Oslo in Norway and from Tromsø in Norway. So every day you can go to, uh, to long year BN. There is a question I can see somewhere. But let's go back to the presentation. I'll be answering uh, questions later, as I have much to say for you. Uh, Longyear City was founded in 1906 uh, by American Joe Munro Longyear, and today there is Cecil Manen, so the administrator and whole uh, administration is located in uh, Longyear Bien. There is also university, hospital, supermarket, hotels, range of shops for tourists, of course, bars, restaurants, and other services. So if you go there, you are in the middle of the Arctic, but you can, you know, buy souvenirs and stuff, and you can enjoy different trips provided by guided tours. Uh, the population of Longyear Bien is uh, growing, and it's around 2,000 people for the whole year. Uh, fluctuation is high as many inhabitants complete a contract lasting for two or three years and then they return home to Norway or elsewhere. Uh, Longyear Bien is really international. Uh, there's more than 50 uh, nationalities in Longyear Bien as it is diff uh, if it's visa free. So everyone can come and try to find a job in Longyear Bien. And many of my friends work there as guide tourists. Uh, as guides for tourists and also in uh, at the university uh, that you can see in the upper part of this picture, a huge building on the top. Uh, this is how the uh, Sisselmanen governor's office of Svalbard looks like to the left. There is building of the university. All the buildings are and all the constructions are set on the piles that are drilled into the frozen ground because there is permafrost underneath. Uh, in Longyear Bien, if you go there, it's maybe not funny, but something weird to see. Uh, everywhere on the banks, on the post office, on supermarket, you can see you should not, you are not allowed to carry rifle inside. And for Svalbard, it is normal to carry rifle because it's forbidden to go uh, to go outside the city without the rifle. But it's forbidden to bring it, especially loaded to. Uh, inside shops and banks for well-known reason, I think. Uh, this picture shows Barentsburg, the Russian mining city. Uh, it's the second largest uh, settlement of Svalbard. And the mining is conducted by the company Arctic Eagle since uh, 1932. And this is also the place where all the Russian activities, most of Russian activities in science, uh, uh, happens. So this is the center. Uh, in the past, there were also other settlements, the Russian settlements in Pyramiden that was closed in 1998 and Grumman Bien uh, that was closed in 1962 because they stopped uh, the mines, they uh, left the mines, there was no, uh, it was too expensive to uh, to extract the coal in these places, so they abandoned these settlements. You can see Pyramiden, the abandoned city I mentioned on the pictures here. Nealesund, located in northwest, and this is where uh, many nations have scientific stations. It used to be a coal mine, uh, coal mine also till uh, the 60s of the 20th century. And recently, it's the International Center for Research with a mix of old buildings uh, from the mining time and also new buildings of the new stations. And there's plenty of stations there from 
Italy, Netherlands, China, UK, France, South Korea, Italy, India, Japan, Germany, Norway, France. And there's also scientists coming from different countries as well. So as you can see, it's very international. To the south, uh, there is Polish Polar Station that was built in uh, 1957. And since 1978, the research is conducted whole year round. There are expeditions that are sent every year uh, just to conduct monitoring of different, uh, different things. The station is managed by my institute where I work. And I used to work there as a meteorologist. And recently I'm responsible for uh, meteorological uh, monitoring. So I coordinate this monitoring. But there's meteo hydro glacio seismological monitoring. Uh, and that's the responsibility of members of subsequent expeditions. Usually it's around 10 people. And this is how the building in Warsaw looks like. And usually I work here, by, but today I'll be there in an hour, I think, because I stayed home to give you this presentation. Uh, there is not so, the, there is no diversity in species in Svalbard because of the extreme conditions, those species that live there had to adapt. The greatest challenge is to get enough food for survival and reproduction. As you can see, there's not uh, no many plants, no trees. Uh, so actually only grazing on uh, moss, on tundra is possible for reindeers. But there, uh, as there's reindeers and also uh, whales, seals and uh, different species, uh, carnivores also live there, and the biggest one is polar bear. Uh, and while the wildlife diversity peaks uh, when the migratory uh, birds return to breed during summer, uh, so during summer there's thousands and millions of birds, such as, I will just show you, uh, bulls, fulmars, auks, terns, kuas, puffins, kittiwakes, geese, guillemots, eiders, uh, sandpiper gulls, fulmars, and others. So all those uh, birds come for summer only, but there is one species that stays for the winter, and that's a rock ptarmigan that is visible on the left picture. Uh, polar bears hunt on the sea, reindeers and foxes stay on land for whole year. Of all animal, uh, mammals, there is a total of 19 species, species of marine mammals and only two species of terrestrial mammals in Svalbard. Those I mentioned before uh, are Svalbard reindeer and Arctic fox. And marine mammals include bears, polar bears that hunt on seas, so they are uh, called uh, marine mammals, walruses, narwhals, white and bowhead whales, uh, and they stay for whole year, and there's uh, also plenty of different whales that come only for summer, like blue whales, orcas, and dolphins. Here to the left, you can see walrus and some uh, whales to the right. I mentioned about birds, so it's really noisy during summer when they come to breed to Svalbard. During winter, it's, you know, calm and silent. Uh, as I said, 60% of Svalbard is glaciated, but there is also tundra there that blooms during summer. Uh, the plant growth and distribution is limited due to uh, large temperature fluctuations. Uh, as I said, Fluctuations from minus 30 during, uh, during winter, that's the lowest temperature expected. Uh, but during winter and spring, it's around minus 15. During summer, it's up to plus 5 on average. But there are also warmer days. Uh, this year, the highest temperature was recorded and it was uh, above 22 degrees in Longyear Bien. Uh, trees and shrubs in Svalbard are absent. But during summer, flowering ground vegetation, vegetation the dense most tundra in valleys and lush green vegetation under bird cliffs uh, are astonishing. Those are really beautiful. And trust me, I've seen that 
On this picture, I will just show you two different flowers, dry as octopetala and purple saxifrage. But that's just an example. If you see the blooming flowers on tundra, it's really amazing. But they bloom only in June and shortly in July, then they just turn uh, brown in August. Uh, for my work, uh, I'm a scientist and what I showed you is just picture what I saw around me when I was visiting Svalbard. And actually this package will include uh, those, you know, pictures, tasks, games, but also more information that I didn't provide during this presentation. But it will include also my scientific work. And the motivation for my work is that Arctic regions are highly impacted by the ongoing climate change and those ecosystems are very sensitive. So for us scientists, very interesting. They lie in pristine and remote environments, uh, far from direct anthropogenic impact. So the recognition of the system, uh, all these systems allows us to understand the impacts of consequences of climate change as it's natural, uh, natural environment, you know, it's very interesting what's going on there. It's not influenced directly by people, but indirect, indirectly it is because people change the climate. Uh, in Hornsund, uh, as I mentioned before, I uh, am responsible and I uh, coordinate this uh, monitoring, meteorological monitoring there. We have data since 1978. So pretty long period, more than 40 years. And that's something you can find in my publications. Oh, sorry, something happened with the presentation. I clicked somewhere in the wrong place. And what we see in Hornsund is warming in the last 40 years. The annual average air temperature changed by 4.5 degrees. That's very high. That's 1.14 degrees per decade. So the whole globe on average, uh, the global change is around 0 0.17 per decade. There is almost six times more, six times more. That's really high. And that influences all the environment. Higher air, air temperatures, they... Uh, because of that, the, the glaciers melt, the snow cover, uh, less shorter, uh, and it influences everything in Svalbard. The amount of precipitation is also changing. It used to be lower, but recently there is increasing trend. In the last 40 years, in Hornsund, for example, the precipitation changed and it's higher by uh, almost 250 millimeters than it used to be in the 80s. So you can imagine more liquid precipitation because it comes as rain mainly. Uh, also influences the glaciers and all the environment. You can find, of course, my publications on the internet, uh, but these are scientific papers that I published. Those are on uh, sea ice extent, on changes in uh, river functioning, uh, thermal regime of permafrost, uh, how the hydrology changes, and how the glaciers also change. The I'm um, a scientist for the last few years, so there's plenty of papers that I already published and I highly re recommend. But remember, those are scientific papers, so I'm not sure it, it will be easy for you to, to read them. But hopefully, you, if you're interested enough, you will learn more about Svalbard and you can find many publications because science is ongoing process and there's many scientific questions that we'll still have. Uh, as for now, I would like to thank you for your attention. Watch other recordings from webinars on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash edoarctic. Edoarctic 2, from polar research to scientific passion. Innovative nature education in Poland and Norway receives a grant of 240,000 euros received from Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway under EEA funds.